Hi, everybody. Hello. Hello. So we are here with Guy and Glenn to talk about these two great books that I believe are for sale here. I'm sure you know who both of these guys are, right? Please clap if you do. All right, so that's good. Uh, yeah, so let's just get started, guys. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, Thanks for having us. Thank you all for coming. Uh, so let's let's kick it off. How did you guys first meet? Where was, where'd you guys? I'm gonna say it was CBGB's Faith Bad Brains, 1980. I met you there. Yes. I didn't know you were there that day. Yes. Because I, uh, I traveled. There was a band from Washington D.C. called The Faith, who were uh, Alec Mackay, Ian's brother. Chris uh, Bald, Ivan. Chris Bald, Iver. Mike Hampton, and Ivor. And I, w I went to school with a bunch of those guys and. It was the day after Christmas, and uh, they invited me to come up to the, see them open for Bad Brains at CBGB's. And uh, I can't believe I met you that night. Yes, yes. I met Ian that night. I was, you know. But Ian was already a minor threat. But I didn't know. I, I was didn't. no. I wasn't. I but wasn't I even in. I was not in the. You were just yet. with the whole crew. I was just with the crew. Yeah. That's great. And I, you took I that did great not know shot. That until you this took fucking a great moment. Yeah, you took that great <laughs> shot of the face. That's crazy. Yeah. What? Gig. How old are you? Like ten? <laughs> Because you're a couple years younger than me. I was 15, I think, 15 or 16. That's amazing. Yeah. I, 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 that's, I just learned that tonight, everybody. Yeah. I'm really happy about that. Fucking what a gig. I can't believe I've known what you. That was gig. an incredible Jeez. show. Yeah, that was an incredible show. Sick. I was shooting pictures that night, probably. Yeah, you took a great shot of the faith. In just the, backstage. Yes. Maybe some on stage. No, I think I took those at 930. Yeah. So that was the first time I ever saw you. And then I worked in a record store um, called Yesterday and Today, when the first fan, photo fanzine that Glenn put out, My Rules, came in and we were selling it there. I remember just looking, man, picture Darby Crash, like looking at Black Flag and uh, just being really stoked and Ian telling me about, because Ian got to know you first quite well and telling me about Glenn. And I think the first time you and I actually exchanged contact was when I was super into Public Enemy when they came out, and Glenn had been shooting incredible shots for the Public Enemy album covers. And I sent him a pedometer that I wanted him to give to Flavor Flav. And I said, I know he wears the big watches, but he should wear a pedometer. And you tell him, like, it's not how far you, how much you talk, it's how far you walk. Or I had some whole rap about it, and I sent him the pedometer. <laughs> I don't know if you ever gave it to Flavor Flav. No, no, no. I knew you before that, though. No, I know, but I was, that's one of my first... Uh, no, but I met like, you at a Fugazi show. No, for sure. And then we got... That's yeah. when we really started getting tight. Yeah, the pedometer thing. That was pretty big. <laughs> like, this is, not, this is not an iPhone pedometer. This is one that you clip on your pants. Yeah. And, and it looked like a little clock, not like the big clock that Flavor was wearing. It flaps on your pants. I tried. I, I really did try with that. Yeah. Like, I tried giving it to Chuck D and Flavor and showing it to them, and it just... I don't... I don't know yeah. if it caught on with anybody. I don't remember. But I, I tried, and I, I wore, wore myself. I, wore no, I was walking around the city a lot, and I wore it then. And, you know, people would look at it and be like, okay. You've you got to put in the miles. That I, was, I, I tried. I, I tried for Guy. I actually did, that, did do that for you. But that is when we probably got a little closer, yeah. Uh, a pedometer we're talking about. It measures how far you walk each step you take. And you adjust it by your stride, too, I think, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty cool. You almost changed fashion history. That's true. Almost. Uh, so, Glenn, you, you grew up in L.A. I started here. I, grew, I moved to L.A. Um, in, in second grade. When my mom and dad divorced. So I actually started in this coast. So when did you, what drew you to the D.C. scene initially? Uh, punk rock. You know, meeting Ian and uh, Alec at that same show where I met Guy. Now I know I met Key there. Um, and just hearing their records, you know, I was just, uh, you know, and then we just became friends. And I saw, you know, Minor Threat play. And then um, in L.A., I think might have been the first time I saw them. And then I was coming back here to visit my dad for the summers, which I did. Yeah, people don't, in my books, they're like, people are like, oh, how's this teenager in New York and L.A. and D.C.? Well, my parents are divorced, so I would go with one in the summer and stay in the other in the winter. And, uh, but one summer in 82, we drove down to DC to see Minor Threat play at the 930 Club. And, um, well, oh, why did I go down to DC? Yeah, just to see some shows. I mean, it was a five hour drive. We had a rent a wreck. We went down there. I could never figure out how to drive into DC. I always got lost every time I went there. But we were staying at Discord House, and because we were invited to do that and, uh, and come and see with? the show. Who came down? Um, I came down with my friend Robbie Crip Crasher, who I went to high school with. 
he was in a band called Cause for Alarm, and uh, and my friend Tanya Abbey, who was a New York woman, punk rocker, who uh, is, is, I'm getting a little deep here, but it was a pretty intense drive down because on the drive down, me and Tanya figured out that we had known each other as children, as like four-year-olds. Her, in fact, her father was a famous artist. Tanya Abbey is the first woman to ever uh, sail around the world. Uh, by first herself. person, yeah, by herself. By herself. And this was years, you know, I mean, we're, anyways, I met her in Englewood, New Jersey, and, and I remember going to her parents' house. My mom would take me to her parents' house. Her father was a well-known painter. And the kids would, and the little girls would just run around naked. They were like three-year-olds, and we were probably like five or six. And we thought they were just like these crazy, insane hippie people. And they pretty much were. But then I'm with this friend of mine driving to D.C., and we just start talking. And, you know, and my friend Rob is in the back, and Tanya tells me her last name, which for some reason I never cared to know before. And I said, I went to an artist. She, or she started telling me her father was an artist, and this is someone that I knew in my childhood, but then we're like 18 years old at this point. So anyways... I go a little far sometimes in these stories. We only have a short amount of time. Uh, you just guys just hold it, you know, just go like this if I'm t going too long. She was friends with the Beastie Boys too, right? She's, that's how I met her, through the Beastie Boys, yeah. yeah. I met Tanya. I met her Beasties. at that same show I met you. Jeez. She had, that's the only, th and the only time I ever met her was at that gig. We were connecting some dots the, here. The Bad Brains. Wildness. You yeah. met Tanya at the Bad Brains, a fake show? And then when show? I heard that she sailed around the entire world by herself, I was like, that woman is a hero. I can't believe I yeah, met that woman. she's that's pretty amazing. And if you saw where she grew up, I mean, uh, her parent, I mean, how crazy her dad was. It was. That's pretty. And she did her thing. The people at that, I, I imagine if you go back in time and saw who was at that Bad Brains show, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was a pretty good collection of people. Um, in the, so I don't want to talk too much about the Dogtown book because I don't want to alienate Guy, but... Because uh, I can't skate. So I was going to ask that, actually. Did you skate growing up? I can't skate. No. I can't do anything uh, coordinated. You play music quite well. That's coordination, isn't it? It's, yeah. I couldn't even imagine writing a song. Yeah. But you, see, you mentioned in, in, in the Dogtown book, when I say... There, there's, sorry, there's a Tony Alva quote that I really like, and it's, when I skate, it's towards the Nugent Hendrix Zeppelin style. And... You know, this you, you kind of see this trajectory of like early skating to sort of the more like the new wave haircuts and the punk rock stuff. When did you kind of when, do you remember when you started shooting punk bands? Like, do you remember the first punk show you shot? Of course, I do. Yeah. Who was it? Uh, probably the Stimulators was the first time I shot photos at a punk rock show. Um, but you know, what you have to understand, which a lot of people don't quite get, like when we were into skateboarding. There was no such thing as punk rock yet. Like, we just didn't know about it, unless you're going to refer to the MC5 or the Sonics or something like that. There was no Sex Pistols yet for us to hear about or the Ramones. That was a couple years away still, at the very least. So, to me, all these things, it's like a natural progression, right? You know, and we were listening to Ted Nugent, and we loved Ted Nugent because it was the loudest, most obnoxious, and aggressive music mm -hmm. there was at the time. I mean, Led Zeppelin was one thing, and Hendrix was incredible, but that's what skaters listened to. And then when punk rock came along, it was kind of like, yeah, that was obvious. That's where it was going to go, because that was even more aggressive, and that's what skateboarding was about. You know, I mean, it was about style and flow, but it was aggressive. So that's a trajectory of the music. Now, I mean, obviously some of this was in, these were in magazines, a lot of these photos, but were you meticulous early on about archiving stuff? Because there's, you know, obviously there's tons of your photos out there, but I'm wondering... Well, you know, the first half of this book is all Stesic's yeah. articles, all the ones that inspired, like, a lot of, like, me and Mackay and Rollins and, you know, the big boys and the Necros and p all these punk rock bands were very inspired by these early Stesic stories. And those stories are all reprinted in this book. And, in fact, in this new printing of the book, they look more like they were in the original magazines than ever. I'm really excited about that part of it. The second half of the book is all stuff that's never been published before. It's all my leftovers and stuff over the years that like, I wouldn't have published back then and stuff like that. Um, but uh, what was the question? Uh, I mean, were you meticulous early on about like, oh, archiving your own stuff? No, because when I was shooting the pictures originally, you're shooting them just to get published right then or for people or inspire people in the moment. You never thought that this stuff would last past that moment. I mean, in fact, the skateboarding pictures six months later were just worthless, pretty much, because everything had gotten had progressed so much and was so much more radical. The tricks and the you know everything that was going on was just different. So you didn't think about. I mean, I saved my stuff. I actually never threw out a picture. I used to even save all my. I used to have the shit file, and I would just put a, all the bad photos in a box, you know, and uh, or save them in the slide box because I used to shoot slide film and used to have all these bad things, and then. 
you know, maybe 20 or 30 years later, I started going through the shit stuff and you'd find stuff that now you could look at and like, you know, you didn't look at it. You look at it with a whole different eye because, you know, back then you're looking for it to be the most incredible moment uh, of what was going on right then. You weren't, you didn't care so much about, you know, all the periphery stuff that like now you look at it and like, wow, look at that house in the background. Look at the style of how he's actually riding and the equipment and, and, and just the composition of the photo is, it doesn't matter that he's not getting five feet out of the pool or doing some incredible trick. Everything else is great. So, um, you know, but I wasn't saving this stuff that meticulously. I mean, like, an, I'm still not, I'm kind of organized, but not, it should be better. <laughs> yeah, similarly, Guy, with Fugazi, I mean, you have, <clears throat> you go on the Discord site, there's, I don't know how many live shows. Instrument just turned 20 recently. I mean, you, you have this book. Was it a conscious decision early on for between the band to start uh, basically doing the same thing, kind of keeping all of this stuff early on so you'd have a record of it? Well, I think all the, most of the credit for that has to go to Ian, who has a librarian gene that's extreme and he always has. He's been, you know, as the head of Discord Records and as someone who is kind of... Uh, you know, been a real kind of force within the scene down there. He's always had the mindset, and I think it's kind of, you know, maybe inherited a bit from his family of just of being really careful and uh, sensitive to the importance of, you know, moments and stuff like that. So certainly as, as you know, punk rockers who move from house to house and stuff, I've lost almost all my shit. You know, I've got, you know, some flyers in a box style, but Ian was always really, really careful about, about keeping his stuff. And with Fugazi, the, a lot of the stuff we never really thought about, we taped every gig, but we never thought that there would be any outlet for this thousands of recordings. And then when the band stopped playing, we were like staring at the closet saying like, we should do something with these. And we created an archive that people could search and listen to and try to find shows that they saw. And it, so it suddenly, it revealed a utility that we never thought it would have once the band stopped performing. And uh, I go down and visit Ian now, and the stuff he's working on is so deep. I mean, he's got, he's collecting, you know, photo archives from all our friends from back in the day, and he's got letter archives, and he's got, like, I mean, he's got, you know, orders that came in for the first Discord record from people who went on to become some, you know, of the most, you know, names that you would never have recognized at the time is just some kid in a suburb who's now, you know, some some rock and roll demigod. So it's pretty incredible that uh, the stuff that he has. And could be so embarrassing. It could be embarrassing. No, he sent yeah. me, a, 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 um, you know, because we used to write letters to each other, you know. I mean, even phone calls were expensive. I mean, I see most people are not that young, but... Um, but you know, I mean that you are all emailing, you know what I'm saying? But you know, and yeah, and he sent me a letter recently that he scanned that I wrote to him in like 1982. The importance of letters for our generation or whatever is so, is just, you know, that is the one thing I do have is I have an entire history of my life in just these letters, you know, that we would send. I mean, um, and, uh, yeah. It's funny because I actually have sent almost no letters to Ian because Ian and I basically lived in each other's pockets for so long. So that's kind of a weird sadness. Like I should start writing him a letter tomorrow. But uh, you used to type letters. I got typewritten letters in, from yeah, you. Yeah, I was big yeah. into typing. Yeah, that was really cool. Yeah, there's a, there's a quote from Ian that I really like. Uh, he mentions in the book that Glenn was making photos with us. And you know, when you think of Fugazi, I mean, you guys were just such a tight like unit of a band. It was I, don't, I can't think of many bands that were just worked so well together. So to let somebody in, I think is, it's kind of, a, it says a lot. What was it about Glenn, besides that, you know, he'd shot you guys for, you know, in your various bands and whatnot prior? I mean, the, I think what Ian was saying with that quote was just that there was a friendship that pre precluded or, you know, was, was kind of foundational even before the, if any photos are taken, the friendship was already given. And that was, I mean, the thing about bands in general and not just our band is that, you know, there, people used to talk about who's the fifth Beatle? Is it Murray the K? Is it you know Brian Epstein? You know, it's like with Fugazi, there's like I don't know. We your community is your fifth Beatle, you know, and the people around you and your friends and the people that you are engineering your records and helping you make art and helping you. So bands are act, that's one thing that I've always really struggled with with groups and with group identities. It's like you kind of have this idea, this kind of you know core thing, but really all groups are like the the tip of the arrow of a much larger thing and glenn was part of the posse that rolled with us i mean but he was a close friend and we trusted him and we 
thought he was funny and took incredible shots. And for me personally, I mean, for a guy who shot Black Flag, and I, th I find you funny. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, you know, it's like for an interesting thing that I think about a lot in terms of Glenn is like a lot of people sometimes don't associate hip hop and rap or whatever with Fugazi or that kind of, you know, people think rock music and rap, they think of, you know, corn or some new metal nonsense or whatever. But for us, <laughs> Public Enemy and Boogie Down Productions and Schooly D from Philadelphia, all those things were really, really important to Fugazi when we started big time. And the fact that Glenn was, you know, I mean, the, the idea that Glenn take, took the shots on those Public Enemy records, which have so much drama and so much story and are so impactful for us, like to have him shoot us, we almost felt, um, I think there's some awkwardness to some of our early shots because in a weird way, it's like, it just felt like, you know, I, we hadn't, I felt like we hadn't achieved that gravitas yet, you know, so it felt odd to, for him to be shooting us, but we were certainly happy that he was. It's funny that you say the gravitas, because I mean, usually when I would shoot band, photos of bands, when I shot them, none of them had been there yet. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So that was really it. But I do remember, if you look in the book, like the first photo session where you guys, the four of you are in pictures, <laughs> they do look quite uncomfortable. I mean, I could see the guys. And, and Ian's not. Ian's just always posing, and he's ready to go. Even, you know, he's, he's a showman. But the other guys, because we didn't, I didn't know them as well, although I did meet Guy at the CBGB show. Um, <laughs> I didn't know them that well. And uh, so, yeah, I could see that discomfort, and, and that's why some of the photos weren't published before. But, you know, again, you look back at it 20 years later, 10 years later, when, 15 years later, when I made the book originally, and um, yeah, you could, there's, there's some good stuff in there. And I mean, and they were my friends, you know. I mean, people, you know, when I wish, I, not that you're asking this, but I just want to say, just, you know, we're shooting, we're making these photos because it's a band that I really loved. I mean, these guys really inspired me. I loved the music they were making. I loved what they were saying. And they were just like really just great, great people, you know, in the punk rock scene, there's so many different attitudes, but by the 90s, by, you know, or the late 80s, you know, in that time, Fugazi was, you know, obviously they were very different than every other band, but they were beginning, like, there was like, there was something about a community with them that was just different than everyone else in punk rock. I think, I remember being at a show, and it might sound weird, but I mean, we were up at, uh, Columbia, and it was one of their first shows, and I don't, know if, I don't know if you were an official band member yet. I think they were a three-piece, and maybe you were on stage dancing with them. Yeah. And um, I was up there from the second show on, so I definitely was there, but, but, but still were, figuring but out you what weren't I was like doing. But you weren't playing an instrument yet? No. Yeah, exactly. And uh, maybe even a tambourine, though, but, or, no? Fuck no, no, okay. no. Okay. <laughs> that was a joke. Um, listen, um, the... Uh, but, but, you know, it was, yeah, they were just really friendly, actually, you know, and everyone wasn't trying to be so tough. DC always had a really peculiar, like, the punks down there that I met through Ian were always, they were just different, and I have to say, more polite and, like, nice. And I think that at that show, in, in, it was in the late 80s, like, I think, uh, you know, people hugged each other which people weren't really quite doing then, and I almost felt a little uncomfortable about that at first. I, I Just to be honest, I mean, it was just a little bit weird, but like, it was a real friendliness and a family thing and a community, and, and I loved what they were doing, you know? And, you know, bef the last punk rock band that I shot aggressively before that that I really loved was Black Flag, and they kind of, you know, you know, kind of just went like this, you know, after 83, in my opinion. It was just, you know, it wasn't the same thing that it was. It wasn't as inspiring to me. Um, and Fugazi were just like, you know, I, and I'm doing all this hip hop stuff, you know, from the Beastie Boys to Run DMC to Public Enemy and whatever else and LL Cool J and, uh, but you know, I'm happy to be with a real band again, you know, like people playing their own instruments and also just the emotional output was really, um, inspiring to me. And of course the ethics too was something that, you know, I wasn't seeing around me in that, you know, all of a sudden a lot of the stuff I was doing was big music, big business, you know, it was like actually successful and like people staying in hotels and stuff it was kind of you know but this was like kind of keeping me grounded but also you know um it was just inspiring me so i just made photos with them whenever i could whenever they were in town you know and and there was no place to get them printed there was no you know there have been very few fanzines by that point and music magazines didn't really care about fugazi at that point that i knew of i mean it's kind of like when i worked with black flag you know five or six years earlier 
you know, when they were at their peak, no one gave a shit. Once they were over, they started putting pictures of them in magazines a little bit because other things on SST, like Husker Du and Minutemen, started getting popular. So they thought, well, and Black Flag was inspiring other people. It was afterthought. But Fugazi were such great people, and they looked so, they were so photogenic, and they just looked so fucking good on stage, and we're just, I just, you know, just had to keep making pictures. Again, there was no place for them to be put out except for maybe in their records. I think my they used a group photo of mine on the back cover of Repeater and a couple live photos of mine on different things. But it was really, I just enjoyed making pictures of them because I wanted people to see them eventually and inspire them, but there really wasn't um, an outlet for them at that point. Uh, you know, but, and I think that's where, I think, uh, I'm sorry if I'm going on too long again, but, you know, I started taking and making photos with them, like, just because, you know, just trying to do different things. You know, before that I was always using a flash and the photos were really obvious and very in your face and straightforward, but I was shooting so much that I started doing different things with my photography. I, I all of a sudden, you know, it was really weird at Fugazi shows because of the skateboarding and because of the punk rock stuff and then even the hip hop stuff, some people started recognizing me and they would like look at me while I was taking a picture and that made me very self-conscious and I didn't want to do it anymore. Um, and at a Fugazi show, people come to me after the show and say something. And so I stopped using a flash because I thought it took attention away from the band. And I also thought it started to make me think that, you know, the flash, it's really interrupting the whole show in a way. It's like this big, bright thing in the middle of the show. And I mean, it doesn't stop the show, but I just didn't want to bring any attention to myself. So I started shooting pictures without a flash after their second gig. And it was just a challenge. It was fun to get more of the setting of what was actually going on in the natural light. And it was hard because, you know, with film, the film wasn't that sensitive. I mean, when, when uh, you know, a really fast film, 3200 came out and I could push it and make it really light sensitive, but the grain really big. You could see that in the book. You could just see the progression of the photos, you know. I mean, when I get the compliment that people say it's like, you know, the best collection of one band from beginning to end, it's just like, that's, that's what it is to me. That's the greatest compliment of all, because I really don't think there's, I think that's a great thing to say of, of that book, because I don't know a more complete collection of one band than, than that book, you know, from, again, from the start to the end. And, and, and plus it was growth for me too, photography wise. And, and photographers could see that. And um, even though I was shooting a lot of album covers and a lot of, you know, big stuff, um, it was the most fun doing this, of course, because they were friends and because it was inspiring me so much. Has it ever been your experience uh, to find a band that was so that wanted to collaborate so much like Fugazi did? Was that a rarity, or were there other examples? I have to say, almost everyone I worked with collaborated with me. Yeah. They all wanted to shoot. You know, we always had ideas. All you know, record companies never hired me. They never liked me. I was always too you know too much of did what I wanted to do, and they, they couldn't tell me what to do. And I would never allow an art director on my shoot or anything like that. I do what I do, and. And usually it was the bands that insisted upon having me to have them shoot, you know, if I like them, because I'm not going to shoot someone I don't like, you know, and, uh, or if they were, and most of them were my friends, almost everybody, you know, I'm friends with. But again, Fugazi was timing and we were all maturing together and we had known each other for a long time. So it was just a different level of things then. But, you know, it's similar with the Beastie Boys in some ways, you know, because I knew them. I met them not at that same show, but a couple of shows later. <laughs> And, uh, but it was a Bad Brain show, and it wasn't CBGB's. It was a couple of years later. And, um, you know, and, and it's a similar thing. It's like, you know, I think I was really lucky, too, to cut my teeth in Dogtown and on the skateboard stuff because a lot of the bands that I ended up liking or that were inspiring me knew my stuff from Skateboarder. So they kind of like, oh, that's, you know, that's Glenn. We know his work. Even Ian said that. You know, he, they knew me from Skateboarder magazine. And so I kind of had that pass to go to go right into it and be right there with them and so I became friendly with people and yeah I mean even Public Enemy Chuck D and Hank Shockley you know they had seen the My Rules photo zine they worked in a record store yeah. and they were like you should do this for hip hop like when I met them they said we had already seen this they had already known that about me and then like even when I you know when I met Ice T he saw me the first time I saw him I was photographing Run DMC on the street you know then it was the first time I shot them and you know, so people have this, they, they see me doing that, and we just become friends, you know, and that's how you do the best work. You know, you're friends with the people, they feel comfortable with you, and I'm inspired by them. Yeah. You know, there's a couple friends' bands, they were my friends, and they asked me to make photos with them, and I did it because they're my friends. And sometimes I did good work, but, it's, but if the band wasn't that good and I didn't really like them, I don't think the work was that good. It's when, but when you really have a mutual thing going on, it's like the work is, it shows in the work, I think.
You, you mentioned like limiting the flash, uh, and in the book you also talk about how you didn't want to be a distraction. I mean, when you go to any punk show to this day, I mean, not, not maybe not this day because now it's all iPhones, but you know, about up to ten years ago, you that's the worst. That's the worst. That's yeah, the worst. But I mean, it used to be you'd see like ten people in the front with you know. How are you? How are you limiting your distraction? Because I mean, these photos are the live photos are. I mean, in my opinion, some of the probably the best live photos of punk, a punk band I've ever seen. And I'm not just saying that. Well, a lot has to do with Fugazi, the subject too. But yeah. But how did you limit the distraction? I mean, you, you talk about how you didn't... I would like squat that. down. I would lay down on my stomach sometimes to take photos. I would just, you know, sometimes I would get very much in the way and then just get out of the way quickly. Yeah. You know, I didn't think because I had a camera, I had carte blanche to just get in everyone's way. That's just really rude and just lame. You know, I, I, I can't stand it when a photographer is standing in front of me. Yeah. I mean, and even when I would no matter what, how old or whatever the fan was, if I just said, I would always, I'd actually ask permission. I said, you, I'm just going to go here for a minute. Do you mind if I just stand in front of you and take a couple pictures? Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, but then a lot of time towards the end, I'm more into the audience than just getting, you know, the stars on the stage. You know what I mean? It's like you really, it, I was more about the interaction with the audience. And then I realized, like, because, you know, I had these pictures of some bands that were really good, and I'm like, you know, you don't see the people. It could be at sound check, and no one would know. And, and, you know, and, and you could see that progression through the book where, so then I am on stage, mm -hmm. but I'm really like, I get in a position, I think from skateboarding, I'm really low, yeah. I'm squatted down. I don't know, you know, I don't know how I was so limber, uh, but I, you know, and I would really stay in these positions for a while to wait for those moments to get those shots too. Yeah. Do you still shoot at punk shows ever? Um, I can't remember the last show I shot at. Uh, I don't, I know I don't shoot that much anymore. I need to be inspired to shoot, to make good photos, you know? And the other thing is, is, you know, there's, there's, there's just so many people making photos now or taking pictures now. It's just I, I, one of the worst things of all is to see another photographer in your picture, I think. Yeah. You know, I just can't stand that. And then, you know, I mean, I did go to a show a couple months ago, and I don't go that often anymore, but a bunch of bands were playing at Union Pool, a bunch of DC bands, and it was really great. And I didn't see many people holding up their phones, I think maybe because it was an older crowd or something, or people just being respectful for a change. And... Uh, you know, but um, but there were uh, it, it it was you know I think you know I, I mean like there's photographers in this audience you know younger people I think it's better when people just shoot people their own age otherwise I think it's weird voyeuristic and just fucking weird you know I mean there's always been this stigma on photographers I think of being you know weirdos and uh, you know and, and photographing these I mean I photograph things these are my peers always and not that I don't want to shoot a band that I like and I didn't shoot you know pictures of ACDC when I had an opportunity to do so, you know, 20 years ago or something like that. But I think it's, it's got to be your life. Otherwise, you're just like a, you know, I, I don't consider myself a documentarian, you know, I, I'm, I'm, it's more than that, you know, so. That's interesting yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Um, I appreciate that. Yeah. What part did you appreciate? I just never heard anyone say that. I think that's kind of cool. Say what? Say the, you know, kind of, you shoot your own Oh, yeah, no, yeah, because yeah, people, I mean, people will ch say, well, like, how come you don't shoot bands anymore? Or like, you know, or why don't you shoot this band? I'm like, well, you know, you should shoot them. They're your age. You know, they're, that's your group. They're inspiring you. I mean, I really, and when you look at my books, I mean, 90, like I said, most of the people I know, you know, and Fuck You Heroes, there's only two people I don't know personally that, I, that are in that book. I mean, everyone else, and all those people that are alive to this day, I'm actually almost in contact with most of them, and I've seen them, you know, recently. Um, the uh, yeah, I, th I think yeah. You go shoot your own fucking bands. You know, you shoot your own things. I, I mean, if there, if I met some young band and I do get emails, you know, will you come shoot us or do something like that? And you know, and I listen to it, and I generally don't like it because I'm very particular in my music taste. And uh, but if I do like it, um, you know, and I look at their stuff, I'm like, well, you got good pictures already. You don't need me to do it, or just find one of your peers to do it, or someone who's really energized by that, who really wants to do it. I couldn't. It just seems so difficult now, again, with all the other people taking pictures. You know, when I was taking, you know, going to these shows and making photos of these bands, it, like, sometimes there was two other photographers. Sometimes there was no one else making photos, you know. And, you know, and even then, it just, I didn't like it when other photographers were around because it just, it, it interrupted my, uh, you know, my space of, and how I wanted to portray things. I, I, and now, I mean, it's... There's cameras all over the place, it seems, and it just yeah, it just clutters up the picture. And, and then not to speak of the whole phone thing, if you do that, that's just out of control. That's a little much. 
Uh, not to get too like Sally, Jesse, Raphael on you here, but Guy, when you look at the book, when you look through this, when you flip through it, how do you feel like looking at these pictures? Um, yeah, it's interesting. Like, I guess it's, I was looking through it today and doing my homework for this event. And um, I, I, the picture that I, I couldn't get past was a picture of me and Brennan sleeping before a gig in uh, somewhere in Scandinavia, right? It's kind of rare for me to shoot a photo like that. And it, we're both so tired. What I liked about it was that we're both so tired. We, you know, we're about to play, and it just reminded me of, of the work involved, but also about the deep comfort level that we had with each other. Like, we're just sacked out on a couch next to each other, the two of us, you know? And, like, Brendan and I, like the drummer, Brendan and Fugazi, we go back. I've never... I was never not in a band with him, you know. I was in five bands with him before Fugazi, and I joined Fugazi when I was 22. So I'd been playing with him since I was like 14 years old. And we would do a band for two years, and that band would break up, and then we would write 30 more songs, and then that band would break up, and then we would do it again, and we did it five times, you know. And um, So when I look through the book, I mean, I just think about, you know, the camaraderie and the friendship and the, you know, the visceral nature of the shows, but that show just, I mean, that, that shot, I just was, because it, it is a very different shot for the rest, of, in the whole book, there's no shot like it, no, but uh, it has a, it just has a, it has a, just a very deep story for me. Um, but in general, you know, it's like, I, I look at the thing, you know, the thing about when you have pictures taken of yourself and there's always going to be the shot that you look at it and you're like, I look so fucking stupid. You're like, and then no one else can see the thing that it, like the weird slight angle on your nose that's driving you insane that no one else can see it. But so I could look through the photo and I'm like, oh shit, damn, look like an ass. Like that's so stupid. But then there's shots where like a couple where I just feel like something is captured or there's some moment that I can remember. And most of them have to do with the physical nature of the way this band performed, which for me was like, you know, we would get on the stage with no set list and then it was a free fall from there. And just that, seeing the way, cause it's very similar to skateboarding in a way. I think like, it's like great skateboard shots, like I may not skate, but I can appreciate the art of it or whatever, but catch, capturing like a, mo a physical moment at a, when it's at a, done at a right. peak, when it's done right. Yeah. I'm saying with your shots, but in general, but it's like the same thing with live shows. Like there's moments like, like the thing for me is like the show, it's almost like there's, there could be 10 million cameras in front of me. I have no fucking idea what's going on when we're playing. It's just like this, you know, it was like, there was so much other level of communication going on, but then to see a photo, which seems to kind of meet the moment in such an interesting way. And, and Glenn was really good at it. So some, there's these moments of the physical, freedom of it that he captures that to me is very um yeah, it's very evocative it's like a, you know it's something uh that it feel it still feels really uh real to me you know it feels real you know, you know what i have to add to that is that i think there's a lot of great pictures in this book i love this book but i mean it's the band that inspired me to take them you know what i mean i just didn't make these photos because I'm there and I'm an artist and I'm composing images, it's like they inspired me to do it. And their performance is what I was, you know, capturing and composing and making look in a way. You know, we talk about that photo of them backstage, you know, sleeping. And it is rare for me because, like, you know, there's a lot of photographers that have pictures of the scene, you know, the punk rock scene, people in their boots and their fucking uniforms or whatever it is. And, you know, I didn't, I never wanted to do that. I just really wasn't a documentarian. I really wanted to inspire other people the way I was being inspired. So I took pictures, I really, even though they're not rock stars, I, but I wanted to portray them in a way that made what they were doing attractive to the eye, to look beautiful, and to just look amazing. Because they made me feel amazing while I was watching them. You know, the exhilaration of seeing the band and what was going on with the audience and in that surrounding, that's what I was trying to show in the pictures, you know? And, and, and so, you know, when people would take pictures, like, because nowadays everyone takes pictures of every fucking thing. And, you know, so, so the picture of Fugazi sleeping on the couch, like, you know, that's actually, 
I mean, I probably was uncomfortable taking that picture. I was like, but but there was, but if you look at it, it's a nicely composed image, and they were both sleeping, and it wasn't like I was taking ten pictures of them. It just like I just looked, I took one frame, and then I took another frame of Joe typing, you know, learning Italian, and it just happened to be we're all a little bit older then, and it was in Stockholm, and I was there. I had a show there, and we just bumped into each other. I mean, we knew we were going to be there at the same time, but I mean, it's I don't think there's any other, you know backstage photos of Fugazi in the whole book. It's not like, you know, I know a lot of young photographers nowadays, they go on the road with a, 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 a band or they do this and that and they just shoot every fucking moment of people living and then and the even grosser thing is, is that the bands are used to it. They're like, they're comfortable with people shooting every fucking moment. It's just like, that's just weird to me. But you know, it's weird with our group, like, I think about like, a, you know, a band like the Beatles who like went through all these transformations in an incredibly short period of time. So the, pho the photographic record, like, is very interesting, you know, they go from wearing the suits and they have the haircuts and then they do this thing and they grow mustaches and all this stuff. We wear the same clothes in 1987 <laughs> that we still owned. Into, so I'm like, how do people take, how can you even feel the passage of time? You know, it's like, it's like, it, you know, it's not like, you know, suddenly we, we were like, oh, that's the era where they, you know, they were rocking that crazy this, that. It's like, we never rocked anything. So it's funny to me that you can actually, you know, I, I look for little things in the photos like that kind of like, brings back that sense of time. I was like, oh, that's right, when I duct taped m my hat. Or, you know, it's like such small details, but it's so f I find it amazing that people found us photogenic in that sense. I mean, it's weird, but... It was mostly, you know, the performances right. that were photogenic. I mean, we did photos, and there are a lot of band photos in here, but it's generally like we were waiting before the show, we had nothing to do, and Ian's like, oh, yeah, Cynthia said we need a new band photo to send out because it's been like two years since we changed it. I'm like, okay, let's do that. Let's just fucking have some fun and just hang out before we go to Zen Palette on Union Square and get our vegetarian meal. And, uh, you know, we just walk around and take photos. I mean, that's what we did. When we were in D.C., it was before a show, and we were just walking around. You know, the band was new, and I wanted people to find out about this band, too, you know? And I was like, well, let's shoot some group photos. Let's make you guys, you know, look good or look presentable to the world. You know, I want people to see this, and I want, again, I just want people to be inspired the same way I am, and that's why I make them and why I did them, you know? That's awesome. Um, we can open up to a few questions from you guys. Questions? Yeah. One, um, uh, are there any either hip-hop artists or punk rock artists that you never got to photograph anymore? Yes, there are, and I think, uh, I can go on for a while, but I'll tell you the main reason why I didn't photograph them is because hip hop started getting too big and people had managers and shit. And I just don't fuck with managers really too much. You know, it's just like, it's usually me and the artist. Like I tried the, you know, I think I remember it was one of the last records I ever bought. Cause you know, I'm just privy. People give me records or whatever, but I actually went out and bought the Wu-Tang Clan's first album. And I was like, and, and the song Method Man, the single came out. I really wanted to shoot a picture of him. And I remember trying to do that twice and having to deal with someone, even though they were friends, we had a lot of mutual friends, and I had to deal with a cousin who was a manager or something like that, and the fact that the person didn't show up, you know, two times to, you know, his, to, you know, a very central location, his friend's house, I just like, oh, I, I've had enough of this, you know, it's just, it's just stupid now, and I think I would have liked to shoot pictures of Snoop Dogg on that fucking cool-ass lowrider bicycle. When I saw that in the video, I was like, that's exactly how I wanted to shoot him. I was so envious of the person who got to do that. And uh, so there's a couple people. I mean, there's other artists, too, that, uh, that I definitely want to shoot. In the punk rock days, I always wished I could have shot um, Penelope from the Avengers. And, uh, you know, there, I mean, there's not a lot of people, but there's a couple people that I wish I could shot. And those are the ones that come to mind. I mean, Schooly D also, but, you know, he was just always been crazy. And I never got to, I met him many years later, and he was even crazy then. So What a genius, though. Fuck. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, total genius. But, um, and, uh, yeah, but, you know, I got... I mean, I made my way. I figured out to shoot, to you know make photos with most of the people I wanted to. So a question for Geek. Um, I remember Ian saying that you guys could play any of your songs at any time, like from your whole catalog, right? So given that, and given the fact that you didn't play with the set list, how did you approach rehearsal when you get together? What, what, what did you guys do? Well, we we rehearsed all the time. Um, Generally, most of the band's career, we rehearsed in my mom's basement um, almost, the, almost the entire time. A couple of times we had other spots, but um, before we would go out on tour, we would get together uh, every five days a week, and we would rehearse for five hours, and we would go through every song that we'd written 
as many as we could get through in one day, and then the next day we would do it again, and then the next day we would do it again, and we would just do it and do it and do it. And I think there were three songs that we generally did never, almost stopped playing almost immediately, and I think those three songs might have been hard for us to pull off, but pretty much every other song, we would like, a lot of times we'd play multiple shows in the town, or we just, every night we wanted it to be a, almost a completely different set if we could pull it off, so we would just try to, uh, just try to learn them all, and I, and I can only think of one time where it, didn't, where we, someone messed up, and it was in at Los Angeles at the Palladium in front of like 5,000 people, and I think we went into the song Promises, and Joe just fell into a K-hole and just couldn't, <laughs> couldn't come out of it, and we were just staring at him, and, and it, man, it went on for a very long time, and I was like, it probably seemed longer than it was, and then I heard the tape, and it's like four times worse than I thought. It's like the unbelievable whole, but generally everybody in the band was really on it and we, we worked out this system of hand signals and I mean the one thing we knew is that Ian and I would trade vocals. So you knew that once Ian was hand wrapping signals, up his- like a catcher and a pitcher? Yeah. Like, That's amazing. Because if Brennan is starting a song, like if I, if I went like this, Brennan would know that we were going to do number five. If I went like this, he knew that we were doing O. Oh. If I did this, it meant burning. You know, we had all these different kind of things so that the person would know what to do. And depending on who started the song, you just had to get the message. So Ian and I were deciding, and then we were pitching the, what the next song would be to everyone else in the band, and you just had to, usually it was either like, if I started the song on guitar, then they would just have to be listening, and if Brendan had to start it, I had to get him the message. And the reason it's a good idea, and the reason why I'm shocked more bands don't do it, is because it forces a level of attention on you, and a, a kind of, tight rope aspect to it that doesn't let you relax in the set. So if you're playing the same set every night, I have no idea what that would be like because we never did it, but my imagination would be like, you know, four songs ahead, what's going to happen? Like, what, what's the investment? You know, with us, it was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> like, you know, what's going to happen? You know, it's like, got to be ready. Like, am I in tune? Am I going to be in tune in time for him to go into this thing? Am I going to be ready to make the move? And we, would, we really had an ethic about making the segues musical and interesting and rhythmic so you you wanted to match tempos and feel what the crowd was feeling and make sure you were playing songs that you know you know were riding the proper flow or whatever and you know sometimes it didn't work great but by i i thought we got pretty good at it and it was uh um it was a it was a really enjoyable challenge and i think i really do think more bands should operate that way because i it just it just makes it so uh it makes it more exciting just for the band, which has to translate to the show, you know, so. Let me do one more. Yeah. It's a question for both of you. Um, we clearly saw what inspired you guys 20, you know, 20, 25 years ago as a musician, as a photographer. What, what inspires you guys today? Um, I'm still involved in music all the time. I, like, I'm, I do mostly production stuff now, and I, I generally... Um, I've been, you know, I've been working with this band Zyloris White for the last few years. I've done four records with them and I'm hugely inspired by them as musicians and people. I've worked with a band called the Downtown Boys, who I'm really inspired by as musical and as people. And that's just kind of been my groove is to always try to find uh, inspiration in, you know, in the people around me and the people that I work with and things I do. I mean, in the last month i saw bikini kill play five times and it was about as excellent as anything i've ever seen and in the shows were as cathartic and unbelievable as as any show i've ever been to so i i, I don't feel i feel like there's a lot out there that is continues to motivate me and, and inspire me all the time and uh um and yeah i guess that's it for me I think I'm kind of opposite. I don't. Uh, I'm not as inspired as I was, but I think um, I think uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez is the most inspiring thing to me now. If there's anyone in the room who could help me get a get together with her to shoot a portrait, I'd really like to do that. Um, I've been trying for about four months now, reaching out to everyone I know, and no one seems to be able to get me the that meeting. I'd really like to shoot her in a you know. Up in she the, was at that gig. Oh, was he? So I, I fucked up. I fucked up then. I should have met her there. Did you get to talk to her? Could you introduce me? 
Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I would I'd like to shoot a picture of her because she's just super inspiring, you know. Uh, having a kid is inspiring. Coaching Little League was incredibly inspiring and interesting. Um, musically, I hear songs every once in a while that, that really, you know, kick my ass and that are inspiring. I can't really think of, uh, you know, come up on the top of my head right now of something particular. But it's not as much for me as it used to be. But I think that I lived through a pretty incredible period. If the things that I got to see and the people I got to see and while it was going on and not to be like the good old days, but it's just a different time, and I just happened to, you know, put myself in these places and see some inspiring shit. I, I'm inspired by seeing other young photographers and people doing stuff that's good, which is still rare. I don't see it often, but when I see it, I really like that. And when there is a great band, I do like to see that. But it's it's pretty rare, I think, for me these days. But I also don't put myself out there as much. And I'm making the books, and I like the feedback I get from the books, and even. You know, um, you know, hearing from people and seeing that inspires people. It's interesting to me, you know, that the photos still inspire people because, of course, when I made them, I, I, again, I thought they were timely of the moment. And it's pretty incredible to see that because I really did work hard making all these photos back then. And even especially when I was a little kid getting, you know, harassed and beat up and, and at punk shows getting, you know, threatened by police and stuff like that. And at hip hop, you know, different situations coming up. Um, so it's great to see that, you know, it. it was weird because it's all about... You know, it's all years later. You know, I wanted it to inspire that much. As much as it does now, I wanted it to inspire then. And honestly, a lot of the photos back then didn't inspire people as much as they do now, it feels. You know, like they have a different life to them and people are really excited and really exhilarated, as I was when I was making them. But more so now than they were then, because I think it was happening then, so people were just kind of... I don't know, because for me, when I got your photo book... I mean, the thing is, is like back then, in, in a way, like the information flow was so... It took, such, it took such effort to find out things about other scenes that were happening. So when we heard about Black Flag or we heard about the Misfits or we heard about these different groups, a lot of the information we got was highly anecdotal and often laced with complete fabrication. So it was like you didn't really know. And then you'd see these photos, just seeing Dukowski on the base, and you could, you could just vampire so much juice out of a photograph. And looking, you know, looking at the back of germs gi record just the portraits of them and how stately they looked but then you'd hear these stories about how wretched darby was and trying to put it all together in your head like he's writing these beautiful lyrics he's so psycho and then they're so beautiful in these photos i mean all of that stuff i felt like i sat in my room just like inhaling the vapors off photographs hard no, I, I, in like, a way that i don't think people have to now because you think you can fucking shit out of nine million Instagrams and you're just peppered with so much visual information and and a lot of it's weird there's so much heroicness to photography and image making and all this stuff it's a lot of stuff that I'm, I'm personally have been very critical of and self-conscious about because I think a lot of like myth making around music and rock and roll is is bullshit and is a lot of it is about salesmanship and ego and um and, and, and kind of like a, a fib that's being constantly retold to create a mythology that's really destructive in a lot of ways. But it's also paradoxically massively inspiring. And it was, did so much for me. And I, I lived in that mythology so hard as a young person, you know, staring at George Harrison's face and staring at Darby Crash's face and pulling these things out of it and then somehow trying to find some way to be critical of it and create my own art out of it. But, you know, it's, it's the service that photographers do. It's like, it's mysterious, it's deep, but it's also, it's complicated, but it's hugely powerful, man, hugely. And it was then. I mean, especially, like you said, back then, I mean, in, when I was, you know, making pictures with Skateboarder Magazine as a teenager, and that was the only communication people had across the country to, to literally inspire them to see what could be done and then they would try and replicate it or do it and not to take away from that because then yes it was inspiring people back then a lot but that's it's crazy weird about that, skating because it was like l learning about trying to see a trick in a photo and then recreate it in like time motion that's without even trippy. having any idea of how people got in that position or in that area. i mean yeah. then a motor drive came into place and then it helped people a little bit more but there still wasn't video yet you know there weren't and, and but it, but again also with the music i mean because like someone like you know in other parts of the world or even the country you might see black flag once a year if you were lucky but then you got to see the photos and the fanzines and which were usually printed really shitty and you know it didn't really you know photos didn't really get to look that good I, my point was is that you know the, i mean a photo of black flag comes out they're not wearing shirts 
No one wore shirts. We didn't fucking wear shirts. Black flag glow beards. Everyone in the fucking fucking scene started growing beards and long yeah, hair and yeah. listening to Black Sabbath. I mean, it was fucking crazy. I mean, it was that's the power of it. They it's added weird. a second guitar every punk every band fucking punk they, band yeah. added a second guitar. Yeah, it was pretty. Black crazy. flag were like the they just were they were sending some viruses out. It was fucking <laughs> weird. They were a virus. They were a virus. <laughs> yeah, um, but I, I think what I was trying to say is that you know. The multitude of people that are inspired now by the old photos as opposed to, I mean, in the beginning, like people like you were inspired by these photos. It was a much smaller, closer knit group of people that was being inspired by it. I mean, the truth was is that, you know, we used to go to punk shows or to a skate spot and you liked it being our own little family. When it started being 5,000 people or 2,000 people, some people were kind of discouraged by that and didn't like it losing that purity. There was, I felt some ways I was disappointed in how watered down it got. But then I always, like, I was trying to get skateboarding into Sports Illustrated magazine. I was trying to get Black Flag into Rolling Stone and into Newsweek when their record got banned, you know. I wanted this shit to be big, but I knew by the nature of it getting bigger, it would be more watered down. But if you have, you know, 5,000 punks in a city and half of them are, like, hardcore, that's, like, 2,500 people are really into it. But if you have, you know, 10 million in the country and... A hundred, you know, and, and some other, you know, there's still a hundred thousand now instead of 2,500. And those are people who are thinking and making decisions for themselves and changing the world. You know, I mean, look at what I, I think, you know, I, I completely credit, you know, hip hop for allowing us to have a black president as soon as we did. You know, I mean, things change things. People's minds were open and they got to see culture in a different way just because of the music, you know, and, and it just made it its way into it. Um, I don't know, it's just, the, all the inspiration is what it's really all about. That's why we do the photos, you know. Um, and uh, that's it, I guess. Where's the next, last question? Or is that it? Any, this guy, ask this guy. So, I don't know about surprises. All these years later, as you look back and you talk about it, what surprises each of you the most about music and photography? Sur surprises? Yeah, about music. I'm going to interrupt. What surprises me most is that we didn't have that this fucking shit that's going on with the government right now actually happened. With all the punk rockers that were, and with all the f smart or you know, relatively intelligent people thinking in the world, I can't believe that we fucking ended up here. That surprises me more than anything else, that we have a fucking shithead in the White House, and that it's, it's just, it's just unfucking believable I know it is probably to most people in this room, but I can't believe, like, we really, you know, hip hop and punk rock, and even skateboarding really inspired a lot of different ways of thinking. And, and there are kids all over the country and all over the world that do these things and consider themselves rebellious. The fact that this was still able to happen in this day and age and that there's still people thinking conservatively and racist and just the ignorance that still abounds, just that's the most fucking surprising thing to me. I just can't believe that it's still, that, that it's still going on like that. And I mean, you know, photography, digital photography and all that, you know, I still use film. I'm still a film photographer. I, I, I've, you know, I use an iPhone sometimes when it doesn't matter in, in the place of a Polaroid, you know, what we used to do, you know, for instant stuff. But um, I, I, you know, and one day, you know, digital is great because so many people take shitty pictures anyways. It's good you're not ruining the environment so much, <laughs> you know. Um, but I think that uh, it, it, I'll get into that eventually. But, um, but and then music, you know, there's always, there's, there's definitely always something good in hip hop or in punk rock or things out there that we just couldn't even predict. But, you know, it's, it's, I don't know what the hell's going on with music, you know, but there's some good stuff out there. I just, um, I was recently pleasantly surprised because I was asked to look at this book that this guy put together called An Encyclopedia of Political Record Labels. And I, I was reading through the book and it was, it had like 750, maybe 1,000 entries of label, independent labels from around the world um, supporting kind of radical politics or whatever. And I thought I would look through it and kind of know most of the stuff in there. I knew like four or five of the labels and then it just was like exponential, like a, a small miners union in South Africa that released records. I mean, the guy, the book is unbelievably complete and interesting. And it just made me feel this amazing sense of the possibility of like, all of these different scenes and situations happening internationally, globally, that are totally invisible to each other, that are all kind of working in a kind of 
solidarity without even knowing about it. You know, that there's like, I mean, it, it, like Glenn says, it is surprising and disgraceful, the stuff that's happening in politics now. But quite frankly, Abu Ghraib was disgraceful and surprising and awful. And so was the first Iraq war. And so like, I think back all the way through the, the history of my adult life, just being like constantly wrong-footed by the horrors of the political situation that we find ourselves in. And yet, I'm always continually surprised by things like this book that I saw yesterday, which shows all these different pockets of resistance and creativity that are happening internationally that I had not a clue about. And supporting music that I may not even know or like, but it's just like there's, I think that's what's amazing is that there's this constant regenerating hopefulness of people trying to fucking fight back, you know? And um, I don't know if that's what your question is, but that's, that's, that's what I would like to say. That's a great answer. I think that, you know, I made a book called The Idealist. It's my kind of art book, you know, uh, not that all the other ones aren't. But um, I think what Guy's saying is right. I mean, just seeing people still doing it and people who still think for themselves and are still really trying to change things. And that book, I, I think uh, I heard about that book. Those people reached out to me as well. I haven't gotten back to them yet. Now I will, now that I heard that they contacted you too and you were that inspired by it. But um, I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of inspiring people out there. It just, it's just surprising that it, it didn't get more, it's not more positive than it is right now. That's the, that, that's the surprising part to me. So I didn't want to leave it on a negative note there. It hasn't come out yet. It is called, uh, I think it's called the Encyclopedia of Political Labels, I believe, something like that. Um, and uh, it's, um, yeah, it was, it was, you know, it just, it, every single entry just was like, uh, just kind of opened up this little portal into like a, a community of people doing something. And, you know, it's like, it, 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 it's just, uh, yeah, it's, it's just, um, it's kind of always been the way. I mean, that's the thing about even the early hardcore punk scenes and the early skate scenes and all these things, like these little communities that bubble up because of this, it's like a pressure that creates this thing and then the vectors that come out of it are just so unpredictable and so bizarre and it finds us here in this room together right now um, having a discussion. It's quite remarkable when I think about, uh, you know, where how it started uh, at that show where you didn't I didn't seem to make an impression on Glenn but it was <laughs> it's quite a journey it's quite a journey yeah, it is. Uh, well thank you guys so much uh, Glenn and Guy this is great the books are for sale um, I think they'll be signing them here and yeah thanks guys thank you thank you thanks for coming